evening or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to welcome everybody to our CLE presented by the Orcar Institute. Um, so today we'll be speaking uh, primarily about evictions during COVID-19. Um, it's a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, some issues that are going on within um, not just the Houston or the um, Harris County area, but um, throughout the entire country with um, a number of tenants facing evictions. Uh, so a lot of the issues that are being presented are somewhat new, uh, somewhat different areas of practice um, for a lot of attorneys. Um, it's a, I guess, a area of practice that's been around for some time, but um, some of the issues uh, are a little bit um, uh, not new, but it, um, just uh, we may not know as much about it. So hopefully um, when I'm presenting today, I'm giving a little bit of insight into the area of practice, um, some you know, give a little bit of nuggets or at least some information that you can use to better represent your um, your clients or at least provide information to um, individuals because I know, how, like I said, it's a it's a big area uh, that's affecting a lot of people right now. So I do plan on um, giving some uh, good information that everybody could use, um, can be extremely useful, um, extremely pertinent in today's uh, in today's time, and hopefully get some uh, some of the tenants and the clients through uh, some of the tough times during this pandemic. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and begin. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now so everybody can see the presentation. So just give me one second. So you should be able to see the screen. Um, and as I talked about what we'll be talking about today is evictions, uh, specifically evictions during COVID-19 um, and knowing your rights, um, specifically for, uh, some, for the attorneys to know your rights, uh, to let the tenants know their rights um, when they're facing an eviction or even when they're facing a number of landlord tenant issues, um, some of the areas where you can find where those laws are loca located, what you can do in different situations. And um, I'll probably end it with some recommendations that I give you as far as client representation during the pandemic um, for landlord tenant issues, um, and then specifically that you can use throughout your practice. So here's my information. Um, uh, of course, um, with this um, CLE is being brought to you by ECI. Um, I'm a staff attorney. My name is Richard Amagala. I'm a staff attorney for the Open Mitchell League Property Preservation Project. Um, and here, of course, you have our address where we're located, um, our telephone number, um, as well as the email address and our website where you can reach us at. So here, I wanted to give a pretty brief overview of what I plan on um, giving you all information on. So I'll start off speaking specifically about evictions. Uh, I'll give some definitions of what an actual eviction is. Um, and I'll walk through that eviction process um, for how it looks um, within the courtroom, or at least the procedures that are supposed to be um, put in place. And then after that, I'll talk about some tenants' rights regarding evictions during COVID-19. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll pretty much go from the difference from that and public housing. Um, public housing is a little bit different than most regular, um, I guess you could say private evictions, only because there's some different laws that are in place that govern public housing. So it's important to kind of know that distinction. Um, and then from there, I'm gonna talk about some tenant concerns during COVID-19. Um, just a little bit of things that I've seen in practice as far as what tenants are saying are uh, some things that are happening a little bit differently only because the current pandemic, um, some issues that they're facing regarding their landlords um, and a little bit of tips that I think are extremely useful um, in representing these tenants in these situations. Um, and then from there, I'll give some recommendations um, for representation um, that I think are extremely useful because these t uh, a lot of these tenants tend to be a little bit um, uh, different than normal, uh, than normal uh, representation of clients only because the eviction process could be a little bit different. So um, I'll provide some information or at least some tips and recommendations I'll give on that. Um, and then I'll go into a newer program that's been put in place, honestly, within the last week. It's something that started as soon as Monday. Um, for something that's called the eviction diversion program. I think it's something that's going to be extremely useful in the future and I'll provide a little bit of information on that. Um, and then I'll, at, at the end of the presentation, um, if there's any questions from the audience and any of the attendees, I'll definitely be able to give, a, give time to answer those. Um, hopefully my presentation is thorough enough that everybody does get everything answered. But of course, I'll leave some time towards the end um, to answer any questions that anybody may have. 
So I think one of the main questions or one of the most important things to, to ask is where can I actually find any of the laws regarding evictions or evictions specifically in Texas? I do kind of want to make note of the fact that everything that I'm talking about is specific to Texas, except I may mention some federal protections or some federal laws, uh, but it's important to note that the um, most of this uh, presentation does only regard to Texas law and the, the um, process of Texas evictions. Uh, so, of course, um, if you're looking for the laws on evictions, you can go to the Texas Property Code first. Um, the Texas Property Code, specifically Chapter 91, um, those are the provisions that pretty much um, govern that relationship between a landlord and a tenant. And then if you go to Chapter 92, it talks about the different type of residential tenancies um, for that landlord-tenant relationship because the tenancies can be different and different because of the different tenancies, they also have different requirements. For example, if it's a month-to-month -month requirement as opposed to a, um, a year-long uh, year tenancy, they, they both have different requirements. Um, and then chapter 94 talks about some manufactured home tenancies. So that's typically something if you look at it like a, um, like a trailer park or something that's along those lines, um, they have a little bit different distinctions in the laws that govern them. Um, so chapter 94 is where you can look for uh, in order to look about how those uh, different tendencies are governed. And then you can go to chapter 24, um, and chapter 24 covers the forcible entry and forcible detainer. Um, and forcible detainer is just the, um, I guess, the legal term or the legal, uh, the legal jargon for what an eviction is, but you'll probably see that used somewhat uh, interchangeably. So you'll either see it as an eviction or a forcible detainer. Um, it's just important to note that those are the same thing. Um, and then you can also go into um, the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, those also govern the process uh, for a uh, eviction suit, specifically rules um, 500 through 510. Um, and then rule 510 of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure speaks specifically to evictions. Um, so you may um, have, a, you may use those rules 500 to 509, but 510 is specific to evictions um, in the JP courts. Um, and then again, another place to look for the laws that govern your eviction is your lease. Um, a lot of tenants or a lot of attorneys may not look to that specifically because they may, may look to the law first. But of course, um, it's important to look at that lease as um, the contract that your client may have signed um, because it it's sort of governs that relationship between the tenant and the landlord. So it's probably one of the best places to look initially because it gives you all the information you need and any defenses that you can bring about that's definitely the first place to at least take that initial look at. Um, and then another thing that I'll get into um, a little bit more detail in a list, some later slides is the CDC declaration. Um, it's something that's been um, put in place to put a halt on some on, um, evictions. Um, and I think it's a useful tool in practice because it's something that can definitely, um, at least if not stop an eviction completely, it could at least buy some time for that tenant um, and definitely give you the opportunity to look for more defenses and more options that could hopefully help, help you help that, uh, that client or that tenant. Um, and then you can also can go to the CARES Act, um, which was a federal protection that was put in place um, in March, um, and specifically Section 4024, which is governing over the residential tenancies. Um, and then the last place that um, you can also look for is the Texas Supreme Court emergency orders. So the recent emergency orders are, um, they go off of what um, the federal government, the federal government protections, but they do offer a little bit more guidance as far as how they're going to be implemented into Texas courts. So it's definitely a good place to look for if you're trying to find useful information for your practice. So if you're looking at the procedural rules or the Texas rules of civil procedure, you might find some conflicting um, rules in regards to uh, the civil procedure process in an eviction case, but to the extent that you find anything that conflicts with Rule 510 and um, the Rules 500 through 507 over that civil procedure, Rule 510 is always going to um, govern over if there's any type of uh, conflict of rules. So you always, if something says, if you read 510 and you read anything through 500 and 507, it says something different, 510 is always going to rule. And then I think a, a good um, advice or at least a good distinction that I can make when it comes to um, the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure is that um, an individual may actually represent someone who is not an attorney, an individual who's not an attorney um, could actually represent somebody and as long as they're not being compensated for their representation. 
So I think this is a good um, point to make because you may have somebody who is a uh, maybe an intern or at least somebody who works in your office. Um, I've even seen it as someone who's a paralegal or someone like that who goes and represents a client uh, only because maybe it's a learning opportunity or it's an opportunity for either that intern or paralegal to represent somebody. Uh, maybe because their attorney isn't um, can't represent that person because of a particular day or time, whatever the case may be. Um, I think it's important to note that um, under the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, um, the person representing that individual does not have to be an attorney, but it's only as long as they're not being compensated. Um, so I think as far as when it comes to maybe somebody interning within a legal office, um, it is a good, um, it's a good way to get into that litigation um, as, especially being that it is within the JP court. Um, so it's something that could definitely give that um, the opportunity to see some form of litigation. And then of course you have the opportunity to um, represent somebody um, you know, in their eviction suit. And another part of the rules, it actually says that a corporation or any type of entity can actually be represented by a property manager in an eviction case. So I think this is fairly common. Um, if you go, if you are representing a client in an eviction case, it's um, fairly common to see um, either the property manager or apartment manager or some sort of representative um, representing that, uh, that property. And um, that's totally fine to see. It's not something that, um, that's, uh, that's out the norm. So it's, it def it's honestly probably more normal for the, apart the property manager to be in court um, than it is for um, the apartment complex or the property to get an owner or to get a, um, an attorney to represent them. So if you see an owner or something like that, it's definitely okay. Um, so I think another thing that I think is extremely important to make a distinction about, about is what exactly is an eviction. So eviction itself is an actual lawsuit by the landlord to remove someone in their possessions from the landlord's property. Uh, a landlord can actually file an eviction against you if you fail to pay rent or for some reason you um, uh, you don't abide by any other provision that's within your lease. Uh, so I think it's, it's definitely a good point to make that an eviction is, actually, is an actual lawsuit because, um, you know, I can't tell you a number of times how much I've had a client and they say that because they received some type of other notice or because the landlord told them that they have to leave at this particular time that, they're being, that they've been evicted. Um, but that main distinction, and I think it's a, a great distinction to make with your clients as far as um, when it comes from a legal standpoint is to let them know that the eviction is an actual lawsuit and it actually differs from a notice to vacate, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in detail when I talk about the process for an eviction. Um, but just to know that that legal right um, to give a possession, it actually doesn't happen until that eviction has taken place. So you always wanna make that distinction between um, when uh, at least that legal distinction between when somebody has actually been evicted or when um, that eviction process actually started. So that distinction in, that, in the eviction process is something that's extremely important to make only because it has a lot of legal implications um, for possession that are extremely important. So then uh, a good question is who exactly can actually file an eviction lawsuit? So the plaintiff in that eviction lawsuit actually has to have an ownership interest in the property or they have to be an authorized representative of the owner in order to file an eviction against the tenant. And I think this is extremely important because you may find yourself in a situation where you have an eviction filed against somebody, but it's filed by somebody who actually doesn't own the property and they have no right to own the property. And, I, uh, and believe me or not, but this is actually something that might actually be common only because you might be in a situation where there might be airship property or there might be property that some, that's in the family but you might have an uncle, a cousin, or somebody who actually doesn't have a legal right to own that home or be in that home, but they follow suit against somebody in that home saying that they need to leave. Um, but if you actually to end up doing the research within the um, property records or you um, look within um, the ownership of the home and you actually see that the home isn't actually owned by the person who's filed suit. So then of course, um, once you find that out, that is a, um, a reason to get the case dismissed because that person doesn't actually have any standing to evict that person. So I think that's definitely a great place to go um, when you take a look at an eviction suit to see if the person that's even evicted the person actually has ownership of the home or at least the ownership right or even the right to evict. So um, that's definitely a good place to start if you are representing somebody in this situation to at least look that the person who's evicting the person has the right to evict. 
Uh, so another uh, good distinction is to make about jurisdiction for eviction cases. So the justice courts or the justice of the peace courts have jurisdiction over eviction, eviction cases and actions. Uh, and jurisdiction in the eviction lawsuit is supposed to be in that justice court that's in the precinct where the property is located. So for, for example, you might have somebody who's in, let's say for precinct seven, um, um, which is um, located um, specifically in the third ward area. And you might find somebody who's trying to evict somebody, but they go and they, they file all the way across town in a different precinct. So if, if that situation does happen, that is something that you can get that eviction case dismissed because jurisdiction is not proper. So if it does appear that the court's jurisdiction, jurisdiction is at issue, what you can actually do is do a plea to the jurisdiction. Um, and you can actually challenge the court's authority to determine the subject matter of that action. And this is all before the, the case is even being heard. So it's important that um, you make that argument prior to. Um, and it's a way to get the case dismissed even before. And I, I think it's important to note this because you might have somebody who's being evicted or um, a tenant who's being evicted and obviously they're not gonna know anything about um, you know, the jurisdiction, jurisdictional challenges. So it's important to at least do your research and at least make sure once you receive that citation from that uh, client that, um, that the jurisdiction is proper and it was actually filed in the precinct that it was supposed to be filed. I think this is a great way to get some cases dismissed. And I'm not saying that it's something that's gonna completely stop the case because the landlord of course has the opportunity to file again. Um, but it's something that even with, um, you know, with everything happening right now, it's a possibility of time um, and buying more time is something that's extremely important to do. Uh, so if, you, if, it's, if you're capable of at least um, uh, postponing any judgment in the case, that's definitely something that for these particular cases is viewed as a win. So that's something that you can do um, to either buy that tenant some more time, um, move that case out of that um, wrong jurisdiction, and then hopefully, hopefully, well, hopefully it's not filed again, but if it is filed again, you can um, proceed um, accordingly if it's filed in the right jurisdiction. Um, and I think another important thing to note is that um, probate courts, uh, they also have jurisdiction over eviction suits um, when, when there's a personal representative uh, is an, of that state is actually a party. So you might find that situation when it comes to airship property, um, that there's a little bit of um, a back and forth as far as ownership, but it is possible to have that eviction suit in the um, probate court. Another thing that's extremely common um, is to have title issues in eviction cases. Um, that's definitely something that comes about when you're dealing with um, some airship property or some property that was owned um, by some by different individuals and probably passed on where there's been some type of breaking in title or issue in the title. Um, so according to the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, the only issue that an eviction suit could actually um, uh, govern over is immediate possession and not title. So if there's, for some reason, there's an issue of title, it's not something that the court is supposed to actually listen to, or at least um, they don't have jurisdiction over. So it is a means of where you can get the case actually dismissed if there's some sort of interrelated issue with title, and that for some reason, that issue with title is going to greatly affect that eviction case. So that is something that you can bring up. Um, you can also make, uh, if there's any counterclaims or any joinder of suits against third parties, um, those are actually not permitted in eviction cases. Um, so if there's a claim and it's not asserted because of this particular rule, it could actually be brought in a separate suit, but it actually, of course, has to be in the proper jurisdiction. And as I said before, if it's something that's, um, if it's for some reason you're trying to adjudicate title, that isn't something that is proper in the justice courts. So I think one of the most important things right now is, to, is a question about what is the federal, federal government doing about evictions during COVID-19. So as of recently as early September, um, the Center for, um, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, they issued an order that's actually stopping residential evictions um, in order to uh, stop the spread of COVID-19. Um, so the order, what it's actually saying is that there's a, it's virtually a, um, a halt on our rental providers that, and is prohibiting any evictions um, that are going to remove the tenant um, until December 31st. As long as that renter provides a re required declaration um, to the housing provider, but another requirement that's coming from the um, Texas Supreme Court is they also have to um, follow with the court if an eviction suit is uh, subsequently filed. 
Um, and I think this is something that's extremely, um, extremely vital right now. And for most cases, it's important that um, all of these tenants, if they, if they can meet those requirements, that they actually fill out this CDC declaration, but they, then they actually follow the steps that they're supposed to follow. So one of those steps are to first fill it out um, and submit it to the landlord. Um, it's not just something that you fill out and you keep to yourself. You fill it out and you submit it to your landlord. And if a subsequent eviction case is filed against you, you also fill it out and uh, submit it to the court. So then the CDC declaration um, is you actually have to give it to your landlord, as I mentioned before, and you have to give it to your landlord, the owner of that property, or any, any other person who has any reason to or any uh, authority to evict you has to receive that document. Um, you might be in a situation where um, there's multiple adults who live on a particular property. So each tenant or each adult in that particular property has to sign that declaration. So if you have two adults who are on that lease, it really, really both of those tenants or both of those adults are supposed to sign an uh, individual declaration and submit it as needed. Um, so as of now, um, unless that CDC order is extended or changed or ended, the, the order is going to prevent any eviction um, until the end of December. Uh, so December 31st. So presumably um, after that day, unless nothing is put in place, then evictions can be moved forward. Um, it's important to note that what actually happens with that CDC uh, declaration is that the case is abated. It's not actually dismissed. It's not, um, it's, it's not dismissed from any court. It's just abated. Um, so it's pretty much if all the merits of it are still in place. It's just abated until that after that December 31st deadline. And then from there, courts, um, different courts, um, depending on the court itself, can set it after that December 31st deadline. Um, so the tenants are actually still required to make any rental payments and follow all the terms of their lease as needed. Um, it's not something that's to say that obviously if they're not paying the rent, the CDC declaration will still apply. But as the, as the rent comes due, it's still something that they're still supposed to be paying. Um, so they may be in a situation where they can't make those payments. Um, but as uh, because that CDC declaration is in place, um, it'll at least give them that protection or at least that hold off until December 31st. So that's something that's a um, extremely important, uh, it's a, a great distinction to make because even if they're not making payments on it, um, it's not saying that the payments are wiped away or that the payments aren't supposed to be due. It's just saying that the eviction or at least that judgment to that eviction or at least the court date to that eviction is gonna be abated until after that December 31st deadline. Um, so the tenants can also still be evicted for any other reason. Um, that's outside of making these payments. So for some reason, the tenant is doing something that's a lease violation or they are, um, you know, any type of criminal activity or something that would typically um, be a reason to evict that tenant. It's still something that could be, that could happen to them. So the CDC declaration, it's important that it's, that it, you, you understand that it's only for, uh, to stop that eviction for non-payment of rent, but anything else that happens that would typically be a reason to evict a tenant, you can also still do that. Um, and that de the declaration itself is a sworn testimony. So um, with any of your clients, you also want to make sure that you let them know that um, they could actually be prosecuted, they can go to jail or pay a fine if for some reason they're lying or misleading or in, in, omit, in, omitting any facts on that particular document. Um, because it is a, it's a sworn uh, testimony for them. So once you submit it, uh, once they sign it, just make sure they know that anything that they're sign, signing is true. Um, and then on this next slide, I'm going to kind of go through the requirements for that CDC declaration, only because some tenants may actually, um, you know, not be able to uh, meet all of these requirements. So I'll, you at least want them to know what they're signing. Um, and this CDC declaration could actually be found on the CDC's website. Um, for all of the, um, the tenants who do want to sign that. So it's something that's been made available um, in our already drafted form. It's not something that as an attorney, you have to draft yourself. Uh, if you do feel as if you want to make it in a different form, that is okay. It's just make sure that you, um, that it is in the form that they've already um, recommended. Uh, so for renters to be eligible for the protection under that order, they have to provide that declaration and they actually state that they've made their best efforts to retain um, rental assistance. Um, and I think it's good that um, that best efforts is actually left in there because it's something that uh, pretty much puts in place uh, not an exact standard. 
So you can actually make a best efforts is kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a loosely used term because for one tenant, best efforts could mean something completely different from another tenant. But as long as you can find your way to, you know, kind of get in, I think they pur the CDC purposely did that to leave a little bit of uh, wiggle room, you know, for a tenant because, you know, as, as I said, best efforts, you know, that's a, that's a subjective term depending on who that tenant is. So it's something that definitely gives a little bit of wiggle room for each tenant to be able to uh, meet that standard. So the next standard that they have to meet um, for that declaration is they have to earn no more than $99,000 for that year, um, for 2020, excuse me, or no more than $198,000 um, when they're filing jointly. So this is um, obviously since 2020 isn't over, it's pretty much just you're assuming that you're not going to make more than that for the year. Um, and it's not, it's something that um, if, you, if you don't believe that you're going to have some type of su substantial income within the next couple of months, um, most tenants can actually make that distinction. Um, so then when you're not required to report, if another um, requirement is that if you weren't required uh, to report income in 2019 to the IRS, you can meet this requirement. Or if you received a federal stimulus payment, under the CARES Act, you can also meet this second requirement. So the third requirement is if you are unable to pay full rent due to a number of factors that remain unconnected to COVID-19. So it's important on there that you, you see that there's a distinction in saying that even if there's a reason that that tenant can't make payments because of COVID-19 or something that's completely separate from COVID-19, they could still meet this third requirement. So they, they left a little bit of that wiggle room in there just so if there's a reason, and it's, it's difficult for me to think of something going on right now that's not as related to COVID-19, but if for some reason your loss of income or the, ten the tenant's loss of income is because of something that's completely unrelated to COVID-19, they could still meet that third requirement as long as they do show that they're unable to meet that rent because of any factor that they can, um, any reasonable factor that they can um, find fit. Um, and then the fourth one, it says that if you are using your best efforts, so you as the, the tenant is using their best efforts to make timely partial payments. Um, so you might have a situation where there's a tenant and they're making payments, um, their rent is maybe $1,000, um, but they're making payments of maybe 250 at a time only because they can't make the payments in full. Uh, so that's something that they can use to make, um, to meet that requirement. But you might have a situation where a tenant isn't making any payments whatsoever but then you still have that, that um, best efforts term in there that kind of gives them a little bit of that wiggle room. So even if you're not making that, those partial payments, if you're still using your best efforts in order to make those payments, and even though you're using your best effort, efforts, it's still, you know, you're still not making any payments, it is a little bit of wiggle room that you can still meet that fourth requirement. And the fifth requirement is an eviction would likely render the individual homeless or force that individual to move into a living quarter, live in close quarters um, in a new congregate or shared living setting, setting, setting because that individual has no other available housing options. So pretty much means that if you, uh, if, if you moving out of this home, you being evicted from this home is gonna re result in you having to move in with others or family and you have to live closer or you have to end up honestly being homeless, um, that's, you can meet this fifth requirement. And it, it, it makes sense when it comes to the CDC's purpose for this particular declaration only because it's supposed to stop the spread of COVID-19. So if because of this eviction, you move into um, a new home, but maybe, you know, five other, other family members or even more, then obviously that would um, contribute to the spread of COVID-19. So it's something that um, definitely falls in line with the purpose of this declaration. So if uh, another question, I've kind of uh, spoken a little bit briefly about it um, during this presentation, but another question is, can a tenant still be evicted for other reasons? So yes, that CDC order, it uh, does not prevent evictions for any other reasons outside of non-payment rent, and it doesn't eliminate any other obligations under the lease. Um, and I think that's a good thing to share with clients only because they do believe that because that CDC de declaration is put in place, that they don't have to pay rent and sometimes that they don't have to abide by other obligations of the lease. Uh, they definitely still do. It's something that's still put in place. That lease still governs that relationship. It's just that the case is being abated until after December 31st. That's, that's the only protection that's being put in place. Any payments that they have to make or any 
obligations they have, they're still in place from that. Um, and the landlord can actually, even while this um, CDC declaration is put in place, the landlord could still charge late fees or any other payments um, for non-payment of rent. So it may be a situation where, you know, that rent is accumulating or those late fees on that rent are accumulating. So it, it's, it's um, somewhat of a, um, it's a Band-Aid. As of now with the CDC order, it's not a, an all, um, all right fix. So it's just something that can, that's just, de it's delaying that case to see if there's any other fixes or defenses that can be put, be brought. Um, and really just for, as the CDC is said to, you know, stop the spread of, the, of COVID-19. So it, it actually may be possible to delay the ev eviction using some other procedures, um, but it's currently still possible for eviction to move forward um, outside of um, the CDC declaration if that uh, tenant can't meet those obligations or meet those requirements. So the process for an eviction, the landlord Lord first has to give what's called a written notice to vacate. And that um, statutorily has to give that uh, tenant at least three days to move out. Um, the notice has, to, it can be delivered to the tenant or to anyone who lives on that property who's over the age of 16, or it can be mailed or it can be posted on the inside of the front door. Uh, the date that's actually on that notice, um, and it's something that, that I always try to make clear to my clients is, that date is not the date that you're actually gonna be kicked out. It's the date that the landlord has to give you in order to file that eviction. So if your landlord gives you three days, it's gonna say the, the wording of it can be somewhat confusing um, for a, a tenant reading it because from there, their, their landlord has probably told them, hey, you have to leave, leave at this date um, and you have no other options. Uh, so the landlord is gonna say, you have these three days to leave, um, uh, but he's, they're probably not going to say you have these three days to leave and then I'm going to file the eviction. What they're going to say is you have these three days to leave and that's it. So it's important to note that that notice to vacate is different from that eviction lawsuit. Um, so then after that deadline for that notice to vacate, the landlord then goes and files that eviction suit. And then I, obviously at the end of the judgment for the eviction suit, um, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about that court process, but at the end of that judgment, then that's when um, you probably have to start talking to your clients about doing stuff a little bit differently. But I, I kind of I go in more detail on that process. But that that's a really really big distinction, um, and I find that a lot of uh, clients and tenants do not know the difference between that notice to vacate and that eviction. So then the process again um, is the tenant, the tenant if the tenant fails to move by that deadline of the notice to vacate. The landlord filed the eviction in the appropriate justice of the peace court. So a reminder of the, the appropriate justice of the peace court is the court that's located in the precinct in which the property is located. Um, so then after the case is properly filed, uh, the court's gonna serve that tenant with the citation. Um, and it's gonna let the tenant know the, the date, the time to appear. Um, and as of right now, it's usually gonna include Zoom information. Uh, so whatever the, um, I guess the, uh, access code or whatever it may be for them to access um, the Zoom information for that court. Uh, so the court could actually look at um, what's available, the, the tenant could see what's available, what time they have court and they could join um, via Zoom. So then the tenant and the landlord must appear on the date that's set. Um, so when they appear, they can, they can both appear via Zoom and it's something that a lot of the courts are um, probably doing as of now, they're, they're having their hearings via Zoom. Um, and some, some courts, are, you still have the opportunity to do it in person, um, but I think some courts have, um, have been, most courts have been given, especially in Harris County, have been given that option to uh, have that hearing via Zoom. So then again, um, I'm kind of harping on the, that difference between the notice to vacate and that eviction. So it's just important to note that legal difference between what happens within that notice to vacate and that actual eviction. Um, so then it's, I just, I feel like it's extremely important to notice, to note that because um, most tenants, they tend to surrender possession of the property after they receive that notice to vacate um, because they're unaware of that legal process for how um, they actually do have some protection and they have that right to that hearing and that eviction suit. Uh, so then after that, uh, after judgment is rendered in that eviction suit, then that's when they, um, uh, they've lost that right to possession of the property. But, I think it's something that's extremely important to um, 
pretty much on the onset of representation, you know, you want to at least let them know that. Um, I found that that gives them a little bit of um, comfort only because you may have a client call you or a tenant call you at the time of that they received a notice to vacate and they think that they have to be out by the next day. So just letting them know that, you know, to give them a little breather, um, let them know that, okay, it's not something that by tomorrow, everything's going to be out on the street or anything like that. You let them know that they have these protections. Um, they have the ability to, uh, you know, to fight this. And sometimes they don't even think that they can fight it, but um, obviously there's some legal recourse that they have. And you just let them know that there are some things that we can do. And it's not, you don't want to overpromise. It's not something that we can possibly, um, you know, get the case completely dismissed, but there are some areas where you can look for maybe even some procedural things that I've mentioned before or some issue that you can look at for defenses. So if, if not possible to completely get it, get it dismissed, it's an, you have at least have an opportunity to at least delay. Um, and one thing that I found, especially during right now um, with the pandemic, um, even a, um, an opportunity to delay an eviction is a win for some people because it at least gives them some time to get their house in order. Um, because you can at least figure out, okay, I need to go here, I need to do this, or at least I can figure something out. Um, and that's definitely important only because, you know, as, as far as trying to rush and, and, and run and to do all these things, it's, it's a, it can be extremely concerning for some of these tenants only because it's just not, it's not something that could really be dealt with on that, on a spur of the moment basis. So to at least give them some of that comfort and that there are some legal protections that are already in place, um, it's definitely something that can help them out. Uh, so another issue um, is kind of landlord filing eviction case against a tenant. Um, and I've, I've mentioned this plenty of times before is yes, they can. Um, they can definitely file for other reasons outside of the non-payment of rent. Um, and some of the examples for that is um, unauthorized occupants, um, an unauthorized pets, or some sort of criminal activity, which would um, um, in most cases be a violation of the lease. So another question is what happens if a tenant does not leave by the date of the notice to vacate? So then if that doesn't happen, the tenant, um, if the tenant doesn't leave, the landlord can then file the eviction. Uh, then the constable is actually gonna serve the um, tenant with the citation. Um, um, they can serve anyone, including um, the tenant or anyone who's over the age of 16. Uh, but another thing is if for some reason they aren't unable to serve that person twice, then the constable can actually post it on the door on the outside of the door, or they can slip the paper underneath the door. But that's only if personal service to that tenant fails twice. Um, and something that I've, I, I think I've seen a little bit more um, now during the pandemic is as far as can a landlord physically remove a tenant from their, from their residence? Uh, so no, this is something that's known as self-help um, and it's not actually allowed in, anywhere in Texas. Uh, so the landlord actually has to follow all the procedures that are set up by Texas law in order to do, um, in order to evict the tenant. So of course, everything that we've talked about previously in following that suit and following those procedures, that's something that that landlord has to do. Um, but anything as far as, you know, physically trying to take the person out of the home or um, anything like that, that's something that's known as self-help and it's not in any situation, no matter if the rent is laid, no matter if, um, Whatever is going on is not something that the landlord can do, um, no matter what the situation is. So then what happens if a tenant actually lose in justice court or in justice of the peace court? So the good thing about um, eviction cases is um, if you do lose, you always have the right to appeal. And you have the right to appeal for, to, um, to have the trial in county court de novo. So it's a whole new trial and you don't have that. It's, um, you can, it's a whole new trial, a whole new judge, obviously. You have the opportunity to present the case anew. Um, it's, it's something that um, it, definitely, it definitely gives, um, if it's a situation where you're looking to buy time, it's definitely something that allows for the tenants to do that. Um, uh, the, landlord, uh, you, the landlord can then, um, the case, everything that's in the case at the justice court is then brought up, but every, the case is completely new. There's no, um, uh, there's no, um, it vacates that original judgment and it's a completely new trial. But a, a, a bigger thing as far as eviction cases is that they actually have to be filed um, within five calendar days. And that's extremely important because it's five calendar days and not five business days. If for some reason five days after that judgment in the JP court, 
um, it is uh, maybe a weekend or a holiday, then that following um, Monday or that following business day will be the last day that you have to um, appeal that judgment. Um, so if the tenant does appeal, um, um, like any other appeal, it can be done with a cash bond um, that's set by the court, or the tenant could actually file um, a sworn statement of inability to pay court costs or appeal bond. Um, and usually these are made available in the Justice of the Peace Court, and they're supposed to be made available in the Justice of the Peace Court. Um, so it's typical for, um, for a tenant, um, for the JP cases, all they have to do is file that um, uh, that statement of inability and it's, uh, it's treated as appeal. So it's something that you'll see a lot of tenants um, probably even do it themselves only because it is somewhat of a simple process in just filing that, um, that statement in order to file their appeal. So it's something that most tenants are able to do it themselves, but you might have some who aren't. And that's something obviously with legal assistance that they can, that can easily be done. Um, so then if that tenant does file that uh, statement of inability in the eviction case um, and the tenant was actually living at that property at the time the eviction was filed, um, then the tenant actually had the right to request a, um, that an attorney be appointed to them at the county level. It's not something that you have the opportunity to do at the um, JP level. Um, there's, a, um, I guess, some conversations or at least the opera, um it's being brought up of possibly doing um, what's called a right to counsel at the JP level. But as it's, as, it's, as it states right now, it's not something that's been put in place, but hopefully in the future is something, um, especially with the, you know, the onslaught of evictions specifically in Houston and Harris County, um, that right to counsel is something that um, I know there's a big push for right now, um, but hopefully in the future is something that could actually be put into place. Um, so then from there, if the tenant, um, if the tenant was evicted for a non-payment of rent, the court's are actually gonna decide how much rent is gonna be put, is gonna be paid while that case is on appeal. Um, so that amount that the court uh, deems, the amount that's, that the tenant is supposed to pay, it's actually gonna be paid to the court's registry. Uh, you might have a landlord that says, okay, the first is here, even though the case is on appeal, and the landlord says, I need my money. But what's supposed to happen um, is the tenant is supposed to pay whatever that amount that's been deemed by the judge or by the court is supposed to be paid into the court's registry. So the court is pretty much holding that money until judgment in the um, in that eviction appeal uh, is final. Uh, so then after that, uh, if um, part of the rent is being subsidized, you might have a, a client or a tenant who has their rent subsidized by some sort of government agency or housing authority. Um, so if part of that rent is being subsidized, the court's actually gonna state in their judgment that the tenant pays this amount, and the government is gonna pay this amount. So even at that, the tenant is gonna pay whatever amount that they're supposed to keep paying into the court's registry, and then the government um, accordingly is gonna do the same. So then what actually happens if a lawsuit is completely uh, ignored? It's never something I'd recommend from a tenant standpoint, um, even if they think that they don't have any defenses, uh, because if it's ignored uh, or the tenant doesn't appeal, um, appeal of judgment, then it's likely going to be a default against them. Uh, so then what actually happens after here is the landlord gets what's called a writ of possession. Uh, so this is an order from the court and it tells a constable or a sheriff to give the landlord possession of the property. Um, from what I've seen as of now, some, uh, some of the JP judges in Harris County are not issuing um, writ of possessions, or at least if they are, they're given sort of a longer time period in which that writ of possession is being executed. Um, by executed, I mean when that constable is actually going out and saying this person has to leave. And um, mainly because a lot of these cases do have the CDC declaration in place. Uh, so if it's a situation where the, the tenant decide that they, decided that they um, signed the CDC declaration after their judgment had, had already been rendered, um, what some judges, I don't, I don't want to uh, speak prematurely and say all judges are doing this, um, but what I've seen some of the JP judges in the Harris County do is they're, even though judgment is final, they're just delaying when that writ of possession is actually going to be executed. So they're giving them that protection until December 31st for those cases that they've already heard. However, what's happening is that execution of that writ won't be after December 31st. Um, so even in that situation, uh, the, the constable comes and they can remove all of the possessions of that tenant from the home. Um, they usually give them about 24 hours and they come the day before and say, hey, tomorrow around this time, I'm going to come and 
um, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm taking the property out of the home because the landlord has gotten this rid of possession. Um, so then in this situation, the tenant's personal property can then be placed on the curb right outside the property. Um, and the landlord has absolutely no obligation to legally store it. Uh, the landlord can choose to store your, um, your property, but obviously if that, or choose to store the tenant's property, but obviously that happens, the landlord can, um, um, can, can charge or at least have the tenant pay those fees that they paid for to store that, uh, the property. So obviously it's a situation that, uh, most tenants would not want to be in, um, if they, if they don't, if they completely ignore a lawsuit. So even if it's a situation where they don't have any defenses, um, I would definitely never recommend, I'm sure no one would ever recommend a tenant just completely defaulting and not even showing up for a court, a court date. Uh, so um, a good question as far as um, public housing is, do these same eviction, law, eviction laws apply to tenants in public housing? Um, so yes, public housing is also governed by federal law. Um, so the protection definitely applies as well. Um, after this particular moratorium expires, um, assuming that there's no additional protections or anything else put in place, uh, the public housing authority can actually proceed with their standard eviction process. But a big distinction as far as public housing, um, it does require a 30-day notice of termination of a lease before an eviction can actually be filed. So that is one major difference um, between, a, I guess you could say, a private landlord and a public housing landlord. Um, you definitely have that 30-day notice of, of lease termination. That 30-day lease terminate, 30-day notice of lease termination is something that's in, that's been in place prior to um, these COVID-19 protections or the CARES Act. Um, so it's definitely something that even after, um, even before or after the um, you know the pandemic is over, is something that's um, that's still in place or that has been in, been in place on Texas law. Uh, so, uh, good question as far as the CARES Act. Or what properties are actually covered? under the CARES Act. Um, so the CARES Act covers properties that are covered dwellings. So that's a dwelling that's occupied by a tenant pursuant to a lease or without a lease that's terminable under a state law and is on a covered property. So a covered property is any property that participates in VAWA, which is the Violence Against Women's Act of 1994, um, or a property that participates in a rural housing voucher program um, under the Housing Act of 1949, or if that property has a federally backed mortgage loan, or it has a federally backed multifamily mortgage loan. Um, so it can be a little bit confusing to at least know what, um, what programs and what properties fall under this, but this is exhaust an, an exhaustive list of those programs. Some of them are extremely common, some that we may know of just in um, um, uh, every just looking at them every day, but some of them are probably some properties that um, even as attorneys we're not as familiar with, only because they might be things that um, are talked about on a day to day basis. Um, but of course, public housing um, section eight, which is a fairly common or at least one that most people may know about, uh, lower income housing tax credit, which is a um, when the um, a federal government uh, the federal government gives a tax credit. Um, for developers to build particular properties for lower income. Um, if the property is a property that's covered under that program, it's something that's still subject to the CARES Act. Um, housing for the elderly, housing for people with disabilities, multifamily rental housing, um, below market interest rate housing, a home, which is um, um, HUD housing and urban developments um, housing program, um, housing opportunity for persons with AIDS, the McKinley-Vento um, homeless, a McKinley Vento Act homelessness program. Um, an extremely common program underneath um, McKinley Vento Act is um, Raptor Rehousing in Houston. So it's definitely something that a lot of um, properties in Houston are subject to this CARES Act. Um, and Section 515 for rural housing, rural rental housing, um, Section 514 for um, uh, farm labor housing, housing pr preservation grants, multifamily rental housing, and uh, USDA's uh, Rural Housing Choice Voucher Program. Uh, so these are some, um, a lot of properties within Harris County, Houston, and, the Texas, and Texas, generally speaking, um, fall under this, um, only because they do receive um, some sort of housing, uh, some sort of um, funding because of these programs. So that's definitely a great place to check if they're covered by any of these programs, and that property is subject to the CARES Act. 
And then of course, um, for covered properties with federally backed mortgage loans. So it pretty much means that they're receiving money from the government. Um, so these include um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, Department of Veteran Affairs, uh, Department of Agriculture and loans under Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So uh, a question as far as the CARES Act goes is does a landlord have to prove that his property isn't covered by the CARES Act? So initially under um, the Texas Supreme Court's 15th emergency order for eviction proceedings that were filed um, before March 27th, which is when the CARES Act was pretty much put in place. So anything that was through there in July 25th, um, all the landlords had to submit a sworn petition and it actually had to contain a description of the facts for the grounds for evictions, why the eviction was happening. And it also required that the, the landlord state that the property was not covered by the CARES Act. So initially, um, that protection was only to apply to through March um, 27th to July 25th. However, the Texas Supreme Court um, has since required that the a CARES Act affidavit, so an affidavit that actually has a description of the facts of the eviction um, and say that the property is not covered by the CARES Act. Um, so the Texas Supreme Court actually says that they require that CARES Act affidavit to submit it with all of the eviction filings moving forward. So that's something that the um, Texas Supreme Court all also offered um, a little bit more protections um, based on that CARES Act protection that were put in place. So if a landlord does not submit um, that CARES Act affidavit, it is grounds to at least, um, um, I guess, and in, in, in I would say that it was grounds for a dismissal, but it is something that you could at least bring to the court's attention um, to at least um, find some sort of defense within your case that the proper procedures have not been followed. Uh, so another question is a tenant lives in public housing and they were behind on rent payments prior to the CARES Act. Um, can they still be evicted? So if the eviction proceeding act was actually initiated anytime before March 27th, um, that proceeding, uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't actually be covered by the CARES Act because the CARES Act was pretty specific in its language for which eviction proceedings it would cover. And it did have a specific date um, that they had, which was the March 27th date. Um, but um, through, if it was, although the, that 120 20 day moratorium that the CARES Act covered, it wouldn't actually apply. You also have, um, remember as I spoke about before, that 30 day lease termination notice that's also, that's always, no matter what is required for public housing. Um, so it also, even in this situation, if it's something that you can't find um, that they, uh, any other defenses, it may be useful to at least see that if this particular property may, um, this particular tenant may be covered by that CDC declaration. But as far as that CARES Act protection um, for, those, for those dates, it might not be possible, but you still wanna make sure, even in this situation, that a CARES Act affidavit was at least submitted um, if, if it doesn't fall within those, um, those dates that are presented. So that March 27 through July. So another question is a tenant receives housing assistance and they lost their job because of COVID-19. Uh, what should they do? So the tenant always has this option to do what's called a income recertification. Um, and they want to do that as soon as possible. So what an income recertification is, is for most tenants who are, um, uh, they receive um, rental assistance from a, a government program or housing program. What they do is they usually submit how much they make. And then from that submission of how much they make, the entity this they make a decision on what they're gonna give for that um, particular tenant's rent. Um, so in some situations you might have um, a tenant paying, um, you know, from anywhere between um, just different percentages of what they, of their rent. So you might have a tenant who pays 50% um, of their rent and the government pays the other 50%. Um, in a situation where that tenant has lost a job or lost some income, that income recertification is extremely necessary because it might be something where you need to change that percentage of how much that tenant pays. So the tenant's income may be reduced to completely zero. Um, so it's something that you definitely want to know that you definitely want to let that um, government authority or that housing authority know that um, that tenant isn't making um, as much as they had previously uh, submitted. So that income has changed and that's known as an income recertification. Um, even if, if there's a situation where that tenant um, is making more, that's also something that they, they would also submit only because the income uh, or the percentage that the um, housing authority or the government authority um, is paying um, would change based on the amount of income that's coming in.
Um, and then that tenant would be entitled to a prompt um, reduction of their rent or at least a hardship exemption. Um, and that hardship exemption or that reduction of their rental payment would come into effect um, the following month. So assuming you um, submit it um, in, um, in October um, by, um, assuming it's done timely, um, then by November you would um, be entitled to that rent reduction. And I think something good to note, especially with um, uh, some things that are in the news right now are that federal st stimulus payments are not supposed to be included in income calculation. Uh, so, I mean, obviously I'm not um, as sure if there's an, any federal stimulus payments are coming in the future, but if for some reason, you know, the government deems that they will be, um, if anybody receiving them would not have to treat those as income for doing that income recertification. Um, and I think that's another important thing to note because if it is um, treated as, as income, it's something that would definitely throw those numbers off as far as um, the income that that tenant has received. So another uh, thing is that tenant uh, has not paid their rent during the pandemic. Can the landlord actually disconnect their utilities? Uh, so no, a landlord cannot do this and any, any type of disconnection of the utilities is a violation of the property code, even if they are behind on rent. Um, the tenant can actually file what's called a writ of restoration with that Justice of the Peace Court. And it's actually going to state that their um, utilities were disconnected improperly uh, or unlawfully. Um, and a landlord's proper way to always deal with any non-payment of rent or any eviction case is to file that eviction. Um, so I think this is something that's, as of right now, it seems as if it's fairly common only because, um, you know, what some landlords or what some, you know, what some landlords are doing, are they probably shutting off utilities or shutting off lights? Um, but that is something that is unlawful. Um, the tenant should, and it's something that's deemed as self-help, which is illegal, as I mentioned before. But that tenant does have some um, recourse in doing that. And then, of course, is to file that writ of restoration. Um, and then once they file that writ of restoration, if a landlord has interrupted any utility services, um, it violates the property codes, as I mentioned before, and they can file that writ of restoration with that justice of the peace court in the precinct where that property is located. Um, and whatever they file that complaint, it's supposed to obviously state that unlawful disconnection um, of the, by, that's been done by the landlord. And then of course, what they're gonna do is have an ex parte hearing. Um, and the, the hearing is ex parte um, and it's something that's done almost immediately only because of the circumstance of, you know, a tenant having their lights or their um, water shut off is something that's seen as uh, something that's extremely important and you know needs to be dealt with in somewhat of a timely manner uh so obviously when the when it's heard it could be something that's done ex, par ex parte um but the landlord or the property owner actually has the ability to request a hearing um after that order is given uh so that's something that's usually done on a quicker timeline so it's something that you can pretty much have um all of these hearings up in in the matter of a couple of days only because of the um, importance or the necessity of some of those utilities. Um, so, so another question is a tenant or a family member um, has been diagnosed with COVID-19, can the landlord evict them? Uh, so no, a landlord cannot evict a, a person only because they're sick and they haven't actually done any, they haven't actually violated their lease in any other way. Um, but the tenant is actually, of course, to act to follow any guidelines that they need to follow as far as um, um, maybe social distancing or at least quarantining for at least the time that they're supposed to quarantine or any other guidelines that have been, have been put in place, um, they are still asked to at least follow those. Um, so a tenant is late on rent, can the landlord seize their property? So I think this one is a little bit interesting because it's, it's something that the landlord could actually do. So if in, uh, in Texas law, the property code actually gives the landlord the ability to place a lien on a tenant's non-exempt personal property for any rent that is unpaid or delinquent. Uh, so if a tenant is behind on rent and there's a written lease that actually gives the landlord permission to exercise um, the lien on the property, the landlord could actually um, enter the rental unit and take anything that's not exempt according to the Texas property code. Um, and they can secure that payment for that delinquent rent. So, but the important thing about this clause, it actually, it, if it's in the lease, it actually has to give the landlord permission and it has to be underlined or at least printed in um, conspicuous bold print to be um, enforceable. And uh, when a landlord seizes that property, they actually have to leave, leave a written notice of entry, an itemized list of all the items that they have removed, um, just to at least let that tenant know that this is what I took. And then here's a list of some of the exempt 
personal property, uh, some of the, the, under the uh, Texas Property Code, and some of those include um, home furnishings, um, some family heirlooms, provisions for consumption, uh, farming and ranch vehicle and implements, tools, equipment, books, apparatus, which includes boats, motor vehicles, um, things that are used in a, a person's typical trade or profession, um, wearing apparel, so clothing, things like that. And then jewelry that doesn't exceed 25% of that uh, limitation that's in the property code, which is 100,000. Um, two firearms, um, athletic and sporting equipment, which also includes bicycles, or it also includes a motor, motor vehicle uh, for each member of the family or for an adult who um, doesn't actually have a driver's license um, or they don't, uh, uh, they rely on, or a license for somebody who actually, who they rely on to operate a vehicle for their benefit because they are an unlicensed person. So another question, um, a tenant has a commercial lease. Um, would any of the COVID-19 protections apply to those leases? Um, so no, the emergency orders and the CARES Act, um, they actually don't apply um, to commercial leases. They only apply to residential leases. However, there might actually be some protections that are provided in some other areas of the CARES Act that might give some uh, um, some legal recourse for some of these individuals with commercial leases. So are there any other assistance available um, for some tenants? So uh, there's some relief programs that are established under the CARES Act um, and other non and other government provided assistance um, that could help with the financial burden that a lot of these tenants are having um, when missing some payments. Um, some landlords may actually be eligible for some mortgage forbearance, some small business loans, um, and grants that are under some other provisions under the CARES Act. But there are some stuff out there, it's just a matter of um, what's available to each individual landlord or tenant. Um, and another thing, um, the county commissioner in the city of Houston are in talks about expanding some already existing um, rental assistance programs. And obviously some of those are um, being um, updated day by day. So it's something that there's definitely something there, a lot of opportunities there, at least a lot of um, um, ability for funding um, it's just a matter of which one your landlord, or at least the tenant, would be able to qualify for. Um, and I think a, another program that actually started within this week is the eviction diversion program. So for this program, it's a voluntary program that permits landlords and tenants to agree on some sort of resolution when it comes to eviction cases. Um, so if the tenant or the, the landlord and the tenant are eligible, they could actually any of that past due rent could actually be covered in full and that eviction case could actually then be dismissed. So what happens here is when the landlord files that eviction case, um, they're required to state in that position, in the petition that they filed that they've reviewed all the information of that eviction diversion program. Um, and then on that citation, it's gonna contain a statement that says, um, that talks about the eviction diversion program and it's supposed to include a pamphlet um, that's actually given some information on um, the di diversion program itself. But for the program, um, the date that is listed on the citation for the trial, that judge is going to discuss that program with the landlord and the tenant. And then if they are both, um, they indicate that they both, they are both inter interested in it. Um, on that particular day, the landlord or the judge, excuse me, could actually delay that case for 60 days, or the judge is actually required to delay that case for 60 days. And then all that information about that case is supposed to be kept confidential. And then they, he lets the landlord and the tenant themselves know about the process for if they wanted to reinstate that uh, eviction proceeding. Um, after that 60 day period has, uh, uh, well during that 60 day period that landlord could actually file for to reinstate the eviction case if for some reason uh, the terms of the diversion program could not be met. Um, but that motion itself has to be served on the tenant um, and then the judge is required to reinstate that eviction um, within at some point, eviction case within some day within the 21 day period. Um, and they of course have informed both of the parties, the landlord and the tenant how to proceed. And then from there, the records of that case is made not confidential again. Um, but another good thing on here to know that for some reason that landlord doesn't motion to reinstate that case within that 60 day period, um, the case is, is must be dismissed by the landlord. Um, it's, not, um, it's not permissive. Um, it's a requirement that if for some reason that case is not reinstated by that landlord, the case can then be dismissed. So then here are some of the eligibility requirements for the landlord and uh, the tenant. The landlord, um, they can't get any rent for anything that's older than, for any um, rent that's older than April 2020. 
um, and the rent has to be, um, it can't exceed the TDACA's maximum limits for rent. Um, the, TD, the TDACA has a limit for how much they, uh, has a, a, a publicized limit for different areas for what their, I guess their threshold for particular um, communities is for um, rental income. So if there's anything over that for that particular community, um, it's not something that this eviction diversion program would cover. Um, the landlord also has to have a bank account and accept um, direct deposit. Um, and if they're um, already receiving assistance or public housing assistance, the landlord would then, would then be deemed ineligible. So that's if somebody else within the, the property itself is already getting assistance. Um, because they have other tenants or other units to get assistance, they would be ineligible. Um, so then the units that are owned by a government, um, by a government entity, uh, wouldn't actually be able to get use this eviction diversion program. Um, and then another, uh, as far as the tenant's eligibility, the income has to be lower than 200% of the property level. Um, and then the household has to be financially affected by COVID-19. Um, I guess it's difficult to think what, you know, what household hasn't been somewhat financially affected by COVID-19. So I think that's a threshold that most tenants can meet um, in this criteria. And then again, the tenant would be ineligible if they're receiving any any um, tenant-based voucher or they're in a unit that's received some sort of project-based assistance or if it's public housing. So of course, this eviction diversion program is put in place for, you might have some clients or some tenants who can't meet some of those other um, federal protections or other protections that have been put in place, but the diversion program is definitely uh, um, another option that I think may actually prov uh, provide a lot of um, uh, negotiation opportunities between a tenant and a landlord where they can actually figure out some sort of solution. So I think it's, um, it definitely has a, it's definitely a positive outlook and I think something that might bring some, some positive results. But as I said, it is fairly new. I think it was, it was actually started on Monday and even on right now, it's still in um, what's called its pilot stage. So um, it's interesting to see what, um, you know, some of the results of this to see how it can actually affect the, at least Harris County initially. So. Um, I think um, I think some good results might come out of this. Um, and uh, I think I'll just kind of end it here with what I think are some good representation, or good some recommendations. Um, if you're representing somebody who's possibly facing an eviction, um, I think you always want to understand that your client may be facing um, some other personal issues um, outside of that possibility of eviction. You know, somebody who's facing an eviction. Uh, they, they, they may be going through a lot, honestly, because there's a financial struggle. And I don't think I need to remind anybody of, you know, all the other issues that are, um, you know, are plaguing, you know, the, the world with um, the pandemic going on. So um, I think it's important to note that that tenant um, or that client, they, they've been going through so much that obviously even the eviction is just a, another problem in their life that, um, that they're having to deal with. So I think it's important. Um, to at least, you know, take that into consideration when you're dealing with that person to understand that there's a lot of issues or a lot of things that are going on with their life that, uh, you know, they're probably just trying to, it's just one after the other. So I think you just definitely want to approach that um, with that in mind. Um, I think another thing, especially if you're a member of the private bar, you also want to um, uh, consider if you can provide your services pro bono or at least even in a, at a discounted rate only because obviously the person who's in this position, you know, they might be going through some sort of a financial struggle. So obviously you don't want to add on to that struggle, but obviously it's something that's um, simply a recommendation. Um, but I think it's extremely important to at least keep that in mind of anybody that you're representing that they probably do have those financial constraints. Um, so you definitely want to at least be um, flexible with what you're doing with that. Um, and another thing is to always remain empathetic for these clients, as I mentioned before, you know, they're going through all of these issues and all of these problems on top of the pandemic. So obviously the eviction, of course, is another issue. So I just want to keep that in mind and be um, empathetic towards these clients. Um, and I think the last thing you always want to consider is any type of alternate dispute resolution. So mediation, um, I think is something that actually helps out a lot more than it hurts. Um, especially when you can go into mediation, negotiation, or some sort of settlement, um, only because I think that actually helps both parties. Um, even when you're dealing with an eviction, um, it's something that can keep an eviction off a, um, a client's record, and um, you can probably even find some way to structure some sort of payments. So I think it's important to at least 
if 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 not take it at least consider any type of alternative um resolutions because i think it's extremely important um and these are some things that if it can be kept out of the courtroom and kept off of a client's record is definitely something that you should at least um take into account so um that's the end of the presentation and I, i'll go ahead and see if um i do see some messages in the chat and i'll go ahead and read them through um to kind of do a q a uh, to answer from there um i think the first question i hear i see here is uh can uh can we get a copy of uh of my presentation so i'll go ahead and leave um my email in the chat right now if anybody reaches out um if they would like to um get that uh get a copy of it i'll be i'll be sure to send it out to anyone who who would like it Um, I do see that um, Gloria didn't mention as far as receiving any CLE credits. And just so for everyone joining us, if you do want to get any CLE credits, um, you do want to reach out to Dean Prudence Smith, um, and then she can definitely facilitate that from there. And of course, like I said, we'll email you a copy. Um, Richard, do you see the Q&A? Uh, when barber shops and beauty shops were ordered to close, some owners continued to charge rent even when tenants were ordered not to operate. What defenses are available to the tenants? Barber shops were forced to close during COVID-19. Okay, yeah. So this particular um, this particular question, it's um, it, it kind of falls under the category of for small businesses. Um, because of the protections or all the things that I was talking about today, are, they fall under the residential tenancies. So there's all other areas of the CARES Act that do govern, you know, those, uh, those commercial properties. Uh, so there are some possibility to prevent that, but it wouldn't be under anything that I'm covering today. Um, you might have the possibility of defenses for any protections as far as if the property is something that's being um if for some reason the there's a forbearance on the property or something like that but i will say uh that's something that's covered under other areas of the cares act not necessarily by anything that i covered today okay we have time for one more question any recommendation if you represent landlord at this time um if you're somebody that represents landlords i think um the main recommendation would be would just I think would just be to um, I think everything I presented today was somewhat um, you know generic so it's good information for both sides uh, so I just think that it's important to at least know that there are some protections in place um, for the tenants so if they are in place you at least want to adhere to um, anything that you're supposed to do so if it's uh, something as far as a CARES Act affidavit you want to make sure that that's submitted um, you want to make sure that your uh, tenant knows of all the um, I guess of all their rights, uh, you want to make sure that if there's anything being filed, um, is being done, and if a tenant is seeking a um, an abatement of their case, that um, that CDC declaration is submitted to you, um, to you as well as the court. So I think that's that's I think that's probably one of the more um, I think the I guess the more standard things to do, just as far as anything that's being submitted to um, the court, is also submit anything that's being submitted to the landlord is also being submitted to the court. Okay. And okay. Thank you. And I don't think I have any other questions. At least I don't see any here. Um, I do not see any more questions. I'd like to thank everyone on behalf of ECI for joining us today and for your continued support. Yeah, and it's been a pleasure to speak with everybody. Um, hopefully I provided some information um, that could be extremely useful for you to represent some of your clients. Um, and then I hope that everybody actually, um, you know, makes a, I guess some sort of impact in the future with a number of the, uh, the onslaught of evictions that a lot of these tenants are facing, so. Hopefully we can all do our part. Thank you and until next time. Bye-bye.